Well, I have to, oh. uh, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll do all of you, but yes, we'll start with you. Okay. Yes. Um, I was surprised at the um, sophistication of some of the conversation on the train, you know, about different ethnic minorities and, you know, uh, the inclusion in the environment and options to emigrate. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, did, I, did people hear the question? No. Okay, um, I'll, I'll repeat. It's a question is about the conversations on the train, um, and the speaker was surprised by the sophistication of some of them. And candor. And candor. We we often unfortunately have this misconception that Chinese people don't are not savvy and they don't understand issues in the world and they might not be able to analyze their particular situation and have a global perspective. And so, I understand that it's surprising, but. It's actually quite common. These conversations are not conversations that were sort of like mined or fished up. There's, these are conversations that are had around dinner tables and, ch and train cars um, on street corners. And so there's a, there's a sophistication and a savviness amongst uh, a much larger population of the Chinese population than perhaps we might understand if we just read the New York Times. Um, I actually was following up about the sound and the process of you two working together. I know you've worked together before. So, we always work together. Yeah, you always work together. <laughs> so what are you recording with, and how much do you guys collaborate on the sound building? And talk a little bit about that. This question is about sound. Um, what do you record with, and if you could go talk about your collaboration. Well, I tried a number of different cameras on the train. And the train chiefs would always stop me and maybe erase my footage or ask me to get off or kick me off or be very concerned because there's these instances of people filming on trains in China and then posting these video clips on Yoku, which is China's version of YouTube because YouTube is blocked. Um, and then the, that train worker would lose their job if it's like some abuse of power. And so there was a lot of um, unease and concern about me because I didn't ask for permission from any sort of official um, bureau member. And uh, on those different cameras, I'd have different arrangements of microphones, and I prefer to use Sennheiser microphones with like a nice right coat softy on it to block the wind, but that looks like a big marmot and it screams like journalist. And so I had to 86 that as a way to sort of downsize my, um, my role on the train. And so the camera I was using is a $700 Panasonic camera called the TM700 that is discontinued and no one really uses anymore. Um, well, at least you can't find them anymore. And it has this 5.1 consumer microphone on the top, and I basically had to rely on that. So it created a set of um, opportunities and limitations. One limitation is that if I wanted to get the sound of someone speaking, I would have to be really, really close to them, as you see. So the shots of the men speaking, I'm like two inches from their face. Um, but the interesting thing was that when Ernst and I started to work together, we were able to pull apart that 5.1 and um, start to shape it and make fine touches to the to the um, EQ and and just see what that. I mean, I think we were both pretty excited about what a consumer 5.1 microphone could render, and then putting that back into this. Um, cinema space, and I thought it sounded pretty good in this cinema. Definitely. <laughs> Ernst, do you want to say anything? Um, I think that covers it. I mean, you know as much as I do. <laughs> there's other recordings in there as well from Ernst's library, and there's recordings that I did with a PCM linear recorder um, in different locations, and so most of it is all sync sound, but there is some really beautiful um, layering going on in a few scenes that I think starts to give it almost this minor chord kind of quality, um, especially towards the end as we start to move more towards the abstract shots of the bullet chains speeding through the landscape. Um, we were able to add some, I think, uh, really important drones. Could you speak a little bit about what uh, train routes in China were used uh, or what would you go? Uh, question is, which train routes did you shoot on? Well, I'm, I, I probably um, was hoping that I would be exhaustive, but I'm not super careful. So I had the sense to try to be um, somehow representative, like to, to represent what possible different train rides you can be on without being really anal about it. So I knew that there was particular green skin trains I wanted to ride on. So the one from Zhejiang to Chengdu, 
which is a train that no longer exists. I didn't know it was going to go out of the out of um, the system, out of the network. But I knew I wanted to get those older trains. I knew I wanted to get the train that ran from uh, Shanghai to um, Xiamen, which in Wenzhou had that accident you might have heard of in 2011 when the two bullet trains ran into each other, which made um, the system decide, the, the bureau decide to sort of put on the brakes. They were going to have their trains run 400 kilometers per hour, but they brought it down to 300 after that accident. Um, I wanted to take the train to Lhasa, but that was the hardest ticket to get, and it was only through kind of back um, a roundabout way that I was able to get on that train. Um, I knew I wanted to take trains that head out to the northwest of Xinjiang. I wanted to take trains in the northeastern region um, that run up towards the border of Russia. I wanted to take the little short 20-minute trains between Tianjin and Beijing or Shanghai and Suzhou. Um, so I tried to take, I don't think, I definitely didn't ride every train line in China, but I tried to, um, through also pursuing my own research with filmmakers in different corners of China, add on a couple of more rides over those three years um, to, to sort of taste uh, an array of different rides. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, uh, thanks for the film. The, the first, uh, that question actually uh, covered um, something else I wanted to ask, but also, what was your view on there were occasionally conversations where your participation actually helped help make a better, a more interesting conversation with, say, the Tibetan woman, or uh, even the when you first asked a Hui Muslim uh, migrant worker, and then that um, sort of uh, simulate, stimulated other people to join in? The uh, question is about uh, JP's role as a participant and even stimulant in some of these conversations. I never thought of myself as a stimulant before. I like that. Um, I mean, I think there's a very long tradition of the camera as a pr provocation or the filmmaker as a provocateur in certain situations. Um, and I, I really, I think one of the reasons why the Muslim, um, the Hui Muslims speaking, um, when they ask me if I'm Muslim, and then the other Han Chinese guy jumps in and it turns into a conversation that's no longer really anything to do with me and they're talking across the sort of like basic anthropology 101 and how little the Han Chinese know about the Muslims and these sort of questions like, do you guys, you guys don't eat pork, do you? And um, you know, the sort of like, and maybe I'm reading into this, but the Han Chinese guy who's like, oh, now that you've, out, you've, you've left your little small world and you've seen the great wide world, have you finally let go of religion and like realize that you know there is no such thing as Allah and that sort of thing. I, I find all of that super interesting, the way the conversations um, digress and, and go in different directions. And so I would never want to sort of try to cut out my presence, even though sometimes I don't like the sound of my Chinese voice. Sometimes when I mispronounce a word or if the tone is not exactly correct, I'd love to snip it out. But what it produces, I think, is in some ways revelatory. Joe during Spring Festival and I had gotten screwed by a fellow filmmaker friend who told me he's going to get me a ticket out of there so I didn't book a ticket and then if you're in Guangzhou which is the most busy train station in China during Spring Festival he just left me in the dust to go shoot his own thing he had to do and so I was waiting in line and waiting in line and waiting in line and finally got this ticket and they tried to take me to Shanghai I was just trying to get out of town and I was I was feeling a little bit dejected and wasn't really interested in filming. Sometimes you get depressed and lonely, you don't really feel like filming. Um, but I met this woman that you saw in the train who uh, is talking about the new life she's gonna have, possibly. And another woman in that train who was also very nice, and she and I were going to go drink a beer in the dining car. And on the way, I was filming her and talking to her. And on the way, this little boy is just like making everybody laugh. And so I spun around and just began filming with him. And I uh, was kind of like, and totally incredulous as to what he was saying, but luckily was there. And, and after 
he finished and I turned my camera back to her, we actually just kept walking. I didn't say anything, didn't ask him his name, didn't ask him where he got it. I, we can assume that you spent lots of, I mean, if you're on a train for like 40 hours, you hear a lot of these announcements. And if you're a creative individual like he obviously is, you begin to spin your own little yarn. He's probably pulling from the critiques. Going back to this question about the surprise that people are so candid, he's probably pulling from the sort of cynical cynicism and the critiques of adults around him and then really wonderfully spinning this great little uh, satire rendition of the train announcement. So I wish I could tell you more, but I think he's just a genius. 